great prehistoric stone circle of Avebury in Wiltshire, described by the 18th century political activist and bardic revivalist Iolo Morganug as the grand seat of the ancient Druids. Iolo's interest in this ancient place was part of a revived enthusiasm for indigenous antiquities inspired by the great English topographer and antiquarian, the venerable Dr Stukeley. Stukeley's published itineraries of English archaeological curiosities were to lay the foundations of the English tourist industry and still exert their extensive influence even today. This archetypal family group, out on a visit to Wayland Smithy, are indulging an interest in a spiritual heritage as old as civilization itself and with its roots in man's earliest sojourns in these islands. Our own contemporary successor to William Stukeley is the internationally acclaimed writer, artist, geometer and geomancer John Michel, whose critically acclaimed masterpiece, The View Over Atlantis, triggered off the 1960s revival of interest in megalithic cultures in Britain. My own personal discovery of a culture which can be linked to the civilizations of Egypt and the Eastern Mediterranean came from the writings of John Ivimi, whose Sphinx and the Megaliths set me off on my very own personal quest which was to take me from Glastonbury's Temple of the Stars, principal seat of the Holy Grail tradition, to the great megalithic centres of Avebury and Wiltshire, Iolo Morganug's grand seat of the ancient Druids, and Stonehenge, perhaps one of the greatest mathematical creations of the ancient world which may well have influenced the architecture of ancient Mycenae. One of my first visits to the stones at Stonehenge was at the 1981 Stonehenge Free Festival where, as a fully paid up member of the avant-garde mime, dance and musical cooperative Canyons and Matches, whose cult following then included the now world-famous Turner Prize nominated artist Anya Galaccio, I was playing support to Nick Turner and the Here and Now Band. These early experiences of full-blown free festival culture, which, before its suppression in the middle of the 1980s, had provided a truly alternative, radical, freewheeling lifestyle for those with a sufficiently adventurous and anarchistic nature to live it, were in many ways responsible for at least some of my own personal politicisation. At the centre of the festival's own canon of folklore was the persistent tradition that it was rooted in some kind of ancient rite, which had its origins in the ancient bardic assemblies of pre-Roman Britain. The original source from whence these ideas appear to have emanated were the writings and topographical drawings of William Stukeley, whose cartographic reconstructions of Avery and its surrounding district have done much to increase our understanding of the original stature and importance of this key megalithic centre. Thanks to Stukeley and his meticulous attempts to record a priceless antiquity which, in his very own time, was still undergoing a process of vandalism and destruction, Avery and its significance in the prehistoric landscape in which it once resided can altogether be better understood. At nearby Stonehenge, Stukeley's topographical sketches of the series of earthworks collectively referred to as the King's Barrows, were a major landmark in early field archaeology, at a time when the pseudoscience of antiquarianism was gradually drawing modern scientifically based historical and archaeological thinking out of the darkness of folk myth and superstition. 
This early scientific approach to landscape and antiquities was to lay the foundation for more developed discoveries in our own era, in which researchers have discovered possible links between the topographical layout of these selfsame earthworks and the constellations directly above them. Towards the end of the last century, the stones themselves became a focus for political radicalism, as the police and the authorities began to devise ever more complex procedures, whilst simultaneously allocating more and more resources to prevent people from gathering there at key points in the traditional pagan calendar. Strange as it may seem, the origins of this link between ancient pre-Christian religious centres and revolutionary political radicalism can be found here at Kew in Surrey, close to where Sir Joseph Banks, the great explorer and botanist, sent his original botanical specimens. Here at Kew Palace, the newly arrived Hanoverian dynasty cultivated a curious interest in indigenous druidical traditions under the influence of the great 18th century pamphleteer and spy, John Tolland. It is perhaps as a result of Tolland's influence that a now vanished ornamental curiosity based on 18th century interpretations of Mallory and Geoffrey of Monmouth and referred to as the Merlin's Cave was commissioned from the architect William Kent. Merlin's legendary involvement in astronomy and stargazing was to lead to the original identification of Silbury Hill in Wiltshire as a possible prehistoric observatory and Stukeley and the Earl of Pembroke's early excavations of the mound itself were perhaps to exert an influence on the construction of another Merlin-esque 18th century grotto, likewise referred to as the Merlin's Cave, commissioned by Lady Hartford in 1732, which stood contemporaneously with Kent's structure at Kew at nearby Marlborough in Wiltshire. In the 1760s, the Earl of Butte was to place a group of eminent Scottish Enlightenment intellectuals, including John Hume, around the young King George III, as well as Adam Ferguson, tutor to the Earl's children and reviver with Hume of Gaelic Ossianic literature, William Robertson the historian, himself an early influence on William Wilberforce, and several other key associates of the so-called great atheist David Hume, the great French man of letters Jean-Jacques Rousseau was likewise to bring the Enlightenment of Voltaire and Montesquieu to the Hanoverian London of King George. As Adam Smith penned his Wealth of Nations, a new Druidic revival was taking place, thanks to the influence of Tolland, Stukeley and Adam Ferguson's young protégé, James Macpherson, the great Ossianic rediscoverer. In Wales, a near contemporary of James Macpherson was busy reviving the Welsh bardic tradition, and it is therefore significant that the origins of contemporary Druidic gatherings at Stonehenge trace their roots to the 18th century London of King George III.